I introduced myself earlier. I'm Glenn Burley, Chief Exec from South Warwickshire Foundation Trust. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the experience that I had in my organisation, um, which uh, is a lovely part of the world, uh, South Warwickshire Foundation Trust. Um, based in the heart of England, um, we provide acute services in South Warwickshire and community services across uh, the whole of Warwickshire to a couple of other acute providers. Um, our main hospital site, which I'll be talking about, is Warwick Hospital, uh, parts of which I'm sure uh, date back to before the castle. Um, we haven't got a dungeon, but sometimes parts of the hospital have felt like that in the past, which is what I'll talk to you about. Um, we were established as an FT um, in 2010, um, and uh, we've got a turnover of 250 million, 4,200 staff. Uh, South Warwickshire has the oldest inpatient population in the West Midlands. I've proved that in the past. Uh, the the, although someone challenged it yesterday, but I'm pretty sure we can still say that. Um, but interestingly, when we were authorised by Monitor, we had what's called a side letter. I don't know whether Monitor still do those things. Um, but it, in effect, said, we've authorised you as an FT, but... And the but for us was that our... Uh, emergency care performance, our A&E performance, was, was not as good as it needed to be. Um, so we uh, needed to set about improving it, and I'll talk about that improvement journey as I go through this presentation. To prove my point, this is a slide which I often update, which um, along the bottom shows the average occupancy uh, by age um, of our, the Warwick Hospital site. This happened to be the final quarter of last year. Um, and some very fit individuals having elective surgery right up into their, their hundreds in some cases. The red bit is our emergency admissions. And I'm sure this is a very similar picture for a lot of your local hospitals, predominantly beds filled by frail elderly that came in as emergencies. Uh, and whilst we think they all need to be there, um, we prove through our work that the vast majority of those patients, nothing actually was happening to them. Um, they were waiting for something. Um, maternity activity in all the right ages there. So we went through uh, a number of winters where we, we really struggled. Um, and um, often our winter plan looked like this. Felt a little bit like that on the Chiltern line this morning, actually. Um, we increased our bed stock. We um, opened uh, outlier wards. Um, we actually introduced a, a whole new ward block at one point, and we saw some benefit from that, but within a few months, that had silted up also. And what are we doing to patients when we're having outliers? You heard a, a little bit of that earlier. We're putting them into wards often with, with agency nursing staff, with locum doctors, uh, away from the specialty area that they need to be in, um, and taking risks around their care delivery. And you've seen the length of stay goes up, outcomes are poorer. Um, and indeed, during these periods, we're cancelling elective work, which often leads to surgeons having time to email me, which is, which is never good. So we were fortunate enough to get involved in a piece of work that the Health Foundation supported um, called Acute Flow. Um, and whilst I'll be talking quite a lot about acute and hospital-based things here, one of the key messages that I want to get over to you is it isn't just about hospital. This is about system flow, and we learned that through our experience. The other site involved in this piece of work was Sheffield, um, much bigger site than Warwick, but actually we found very similar learning points from the two sites. Um, the entire report is available on the Health Foundation website. It's actually been one, of, been one of the most popular pieces of work that they have done. So a lovely photograph there of the Warwick Hospital site. Um, the sign is a lot smaller than it looks. Um, and um, we've got a kind of traditional uh, NHS site that's, uh, that's grown over the years. From that piece of work, which was published um, in 2013, um, we, uh, in fact, at the point it was published, um, Monitor came in and said, actually, your only performance is still not improved. We're, we're going to launch an investigation into you, um, which when monitors say they're going to do that, the first thing they do is issue a press statement to your local media, which is never nice. Um, we were able to say we're just about to implement 
the things that we've learned through the Health Foundation programme. And, and to be fair to Monitor, they um, accepted that and gave us time to show that these results were coming through, and they did. So what did it tell us? The clear link between mortality and flow is, is something that you've already seen some data on, you'll see some more data on later. Um, and it's, um, it now appears obvious to us, but actually when we did this piece of work, there wasn't a great deal of evidence out there to support that. Variation driven by admission date, not discharge date. That's, uh, again, some learning that has been reinforced through some other studies. But it really does emphasize the point that getting things right at the first point of contact with patients is vital. And as I'll come back to later, the frailty model to ensure that we don't admit uh, patients is an important part of that. But if we, if we make the right decisions, identify the right specialties, get patients to the right part of the hospital, then their journey and their experience and their outcomes are going to be much better. Emergency demand is relatively flat. Yes, there are, there are uh, patterns to it, but it's, it's relatively predictable. But our capacity is variable, particularly out of hours. Um, and obviously, a lot of us have been implementing solutions to out of hours, but it, it really is a wide variation in capacity that affects the flow of the entire hospital and the entire system. So what we found is that individual support departments maximize their own productivity. So they tend to work within their environment and work very well from their perspective. But when you put all of that together, it doesn't achieve the best flow for the patients. So we demonstrated that actually some of those departments could work suboptimally from their perspective in order to make the flow work for everyone. And we showed that alignment of capacity to demand improves flow, improves quality, and improves productivity, and it actually does reduce costs. So we produced a rather large business case at the end of our study, which put some extra costs into the front door, but a few months later, we were able to take some ward capacity out at the back of the site. But the other thing that we learned is that when we made the changes to the hospital itself, much of what that did although we saw improvement in fits and starts, it moved the queue from the front door to the back door, and we still had issues around backlog in hospitals. So it only really worked when the entire system was working in harmony with capacity and flow. Now, this was reinforced helpfully by a uh, piece of work that Monitor did this summer. They look back at last winter, um, and you'll hopefully have seen this graphic. Um, I think one of the most important messages is that A&E departments did well last winter. With the demand that was placed on them, patients got a really good service from our A&Es, but of course there were still huge numbers of patients waiting in A&E departments. And why was that? It was for those areas that are identified in red and amber on that chart. So a higher level of ambulance uh, um, arrivals, uh, delays in other departments within the heart of the hospital, and then delays, as this shows it as a flow out of hospital, but equally it's uh, issues around admission prevention in community and social care settings. So that was a really helpful um, document. Uh, and around that time, um, uh, Safer, Faster, Better came out as well. Um, so two really good reference documents, and we'll keep going on about that document. It's there. Um, I saw one or two people picking it up and looking at it. Um, if you haven't read it already, I kind of challenge you as to why not if you're struggling with urgent care in your system, because it's, um, it's a really good guide. And a lot of the things that are in there are really not rocket science. But I was also given a, a really helpful uh, reference book by one of our consultants, uh, a year or so ago, which I'm sure many of the clinicians in the room will have also had, um, which is called Harry Goes to Hospital, um, available at Sainsbury's and probably other supermarkets um, also available. Um, Harry has an appendicitis and, and, and gets rushed into his local hospital. And what you can see from, um, from uh, this particular picture is that we create a very complex system. Um, in a hospital and outside of hospital with lots of carved out different roles and responsibilities. You look across that chart, it, it always worries the infection control people to see wristwatches being worn. Um, 
I'm convinced that they would notice the wristwatch before the hippo, actually, if, if that was available, if that was happening in your hospital. Um, but lots of different roles, lots of different people trying to do the right thing in their part of the system, um, but in some cases not working together in a coordinated way. Buried away in the middle of that picture, you can see the hospital manager smiling in front of his charts. Um, it's probably not his A&E performance, it's his CIP that he's, he's smiling about in this particular occasion because he's delivered it. But how has he delivered it? So back into the heart of the hospital, individual departments doing all the right things, processes working in those departments. But what we found is that they were on their own in, in delivering efficiency and productivity but not in a flowing system. And of course, we also identified the dripping tap of discharges at the, the far end of the site. So one of the things that really helped me in uh, our experience at Warwick was uh, a complaint. Um, so you don't often hear a chief exec say that. I was really pleased to receive a complaint um, early on in the process from a gentleman called Jerry, who was very eloquent. He wrote an excellent letter to me, which told me about his experience. He was with us for eight days. Um, and he said the clinicians were fantastic. I was really impressed with all of the, the doctors, the nurses, the therapists that I saw. But actually, they weren't that coordinated. So the baton was dropped between them. The communication was not clear between them. Uh, and I felt that didn't work really well for me. So rather than sending out the standard, um, I'm sorry if you feel that you need to complain response, uh, we took the opportunity to bring him in. So he came in and sat in a room with a number of our consultants um, who were involved in his care and told them about his journey. Um, and whilst they loved the first bit about how good they all were, they were all rather ashamed about a system that they preside over that was not connected and that was affecting a patient in this particular way. Uh, and we process mapped that, and what we found in those eight days is there were only 34 hours of actual value added time. So the rest of the time, Jerry was waiting for someone to make a decision, a result to come back, a test to be undertaken, TTOs to come back or even to be written up in the first place. So lots of different parts where he's just sitting and waiting. So go back to that chart that I showed you at the start of bed occupancy. There's lots of Jerry's all across all of our hospitals. So there's lots of bed days. In, in effect, what is the most expensive part of the system being wasted through weight and wastage? So um, we wanted to do something about that. So what we did with this one is we, we realized that one of the issues was around blood results. Um, and this came out from Jerry's story. In fact, um, uh, we, we nearly made a, a big mistake with his care because they hadn't got um, uh, relevant blood, blood results for him. And we found that only around 20% of the blood results on any one day were, were taken that day. In most cases, they were one or two days old. Uh, and why is that? But if you look at the um, picture, bottom right-hand corner, uh, our blood sciences lab delivered their CIB, CIP by uh, uh, buying a, a really big analyzer. So the analyzer that they had dealt with really big batches. They dramatically reduced the price of their test down to pence. Uh, but as a result, in order to run the big analyzer, you had to batch the work. So the work came in from the wards, and when it was full, they ran it and got the results out and took them back to the wards. So great delivery of CIP, really efficient department, but absolutely not working for the other parts of the hospital. So what we did was involve the phlebotomists, the porters, um, blood sciences team, the consultants, and looked at whether we could do that differently. Uh, and as a result, we came up with a solution that didn't cost us anything at all. So that's one of the other key messages here. They had a situation where the phlebotomist started a little bit earlier, where the porters um, shuttled work back to the lab, and where the lab just got on and did it and gave the results back to the ward. So we moved to a situation where we had 80% of the bloods when the consultants doing the ward round were taken that day, and therefore the decision-making was much sharper. Uh, in, that, in fact, the need for doing further bloods was reduced, 
uh, and the system therefore will work much more effectively. Another spin-off, which I wasn't uh, expecting, was uh, that we also found that by the time um, the GP bloods came into the lab uh, in the middle of the day, um, we were doing a lot of the work previously for the wards. So as a result of streamlining the ward work, they actually had capacity to do GP work more quickly. So I should have framed it. I had a, 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 an email from a GP thanking me for something I hadn't even realized we'd done, which was speeding up the results for, for primary care. So um, that was a really important learning point for us. And we applied that methodology to a number of other support departments particularly radiology with similar issues. I'm now going to talk about something else that we did, which I'm sure many of you will have already done, but it highlights um, some of the issues around use of time series data. So the chart on the left there shows you um, the arrivals in A&E in green, and then admissions to the other part of the hospital um, in red, and it's showing a delay uh, in effect from arrival to admission. And as a result of that delay, and if you look at the chart below, you align that to the clinical resources, to the, particularly the senior decision-making doctors. Most of the patients are leaving the A&E and arriving in our medical assessment unit at a point when a lot of the doctors' shifts are finishing. Uh, and what happens to that work? Well, it waits until the next day in some cases. Uh, or we're expecting middle grade or junior doctors to uh, work miracles over the evening, often when other parts of the hospital are not there. So uh, what we did, and I'm sure many of you have already done this with your sites, is realign that. We extended the availability of senior decision-making doctors in the MAU, and indeed we've done this in another of other, other parts of the hospital, such that it aligned to the demand of uh, the day on an hourly basis, and as a result, uh, the interesting thing you see from this chart on the right is that it's actually speeded up the point at which they do go into the hospital because the delays in A&E have reduced. So this also tells you something else about the use of improvement techniques is you do really need to equip your clinical and managerial teams and departments with the skills to continue to do this because as you change one part of a process, it has an impact on another part of the site. Uh, and what we created was a rather large circuit diagram of the hospital. Um, and each time we made an improvement somewhere, it affected everything else. So it's something you need to continue to do uh, and very much something you need to look at on a time series basis because averages really don't tell the story. So we took this methodology, as I said at the start, we applied it in the hospital, but we also then realized that we needed to apply it into the community services that we also were involved in in our system. And these are the princ principles that we still have today in our system that we implemented. So access before admission. So our community emergency response team um, are a team that respond within two hours to um, provide support in community settings to avoid the need to go to hospital. Um, having been involved in running community services for a number of years now, I think it's fair to say an urgent response was often seen as days rather than hours, and it really needs to be seen in an hours concept. So we've moved to a, an hours-based concept and obviously seven-day working for, for those services. We also have ambulatory emergency care pathways. Um, many of you will have put these in place also. What we try not to do is stick to the list of pathways. We try to take the view that every patient could be ambulatory and should be considered to be ambulatory until we prove otherwise and we, we, we need to admit them. Um, but yes, the, the, the numbers of patients that we now have through that pathway are, are, are really, really, really large. Uh, and we've also, through that, a, been able to get our primary care colleagues to get into the mindset of this is an assessment, not an admission. So they're not, patients are not arriving in their pyjamas. They're coming for an assessment that hopefully will be on an ambulatory basis. And indeed, the ability for those people to provide telephone advice and support to primary care also. We've implemented today's work today. So very much the concept of, of the uh, blood sciences work and all the work that we did through uh, the Health Foundation was about making sure that we, we uh, we made decisions at the front door as quickly as possible. Nothing waited till tomorrow. 
As part of that, we implemented specialty pool. So within our MAU, the admitting specialties go in there every day and look for their patients. Uh, they're not waiting for the baton to be passed on to them. That means they identify their patients, but it also means that they identify uh, and start to initiate treatments for those patients before they come into their base ward. And that has speeded things up, um, and um, it certainly improved the team working between the MAU consultants and the other physicians. We have seven by seven diagnostics. Uh, we have acute physicians over seven days, A&E consultants over seven days. I'm sure many of you are doing that, but it's making sure that the diagnostics are there to support that. And we implemented Physician of the Week. So prior to this, on any one day, it would be a different consultant. So one cardiologist today, another one tomorrow. And whilst they always reassured me that they did work together as a team and then did make the same decisions, they actually didn't. They'd all got slightly different nuances uh, and slightly different interests. And as a consequence of that, what we saw was that we, we had a, a, a dysfunctional arrangement. Moving to um, Physician of the Week meant that uh, whilst it was hard work at the start of the week to, do, to get to grips with those patients, as the week moved on, it was more of a business round. Decisions were, con uh, were, were able to show some continuity from one day to the next. The clinical staff, the ward staff, uh, really appreciated having the same consultant there for the entire week. We had to unravel all of the job plans to do that, but it was really worthwhile. Some of the consultants didn't want to do it but most of the consultants now looking back would say it's absolutely the right thing and they love it. They're not in the room to confirm that, but uh, believe me. Um, so other things, frailty specialist service. So you'll hear more about this uh, later from, from, from Ian. Um, making sure that we, we, we uh, take this gold, I think we, we refer to the golden hour in trauma and I think we're possibly moving to the kind of golden day for frailty, that we really need to ensure that we do all the right things quickly so that we don't admit patients, probably should be the silver day thinking about it, that we don't admit these patients into the hospital. Um, and we've put um, some really, uh, really good elderly care physicians in a uh, frailty unit. We split our MAU so we've got frailty and other patients. Um, and we, uh, we've also put an a, a, a elder care physician into A&E as well. Specialist MDT to support that, very much about home first concept. And then finally, discharge to assess. So um, discharge to assess, three pathways. Um, we often talk about the beds, but most importantly, it's a home first principle. So around 70% of these patients should be able to go home for their assessment. Why are we assessing these patients in an acute hospital setting? It's an alien setting. We're leading to more delays and creating a situation where they're dependent on, a, on an acute setting. So um, we do buy some beds as part of that. So a very small number of patients need to be in a nursing home setting for that. As an acute trust, we've actually, we're actually paying for that. Um, CCG paid for it initially, but the evidence is that it speeds up flow, it improves quality and outcomes, and actually more patients go home as a consequence. So less uh, long-term care packages um, as a result of having that model in place. So uh, I'll quickly canter through some of the um, measures, but um, all of our outcomes are generally green on this. We're continuing to deliver the A&E standard, reduce length of stay in both hospital, uh, acute hospital and community hospital. One of the important things for us, shimmy, so our mortality is improved by nine points. Uh, and the evidence from one of the other sites, Derby, is a very similar figure. It's a slight time delay, probably uh, around six to eight months, but it really does evidence that, that mortality improves. Reducing outliers, reducing cancellations, stopping the emails from surgeons is probably another indicator I could have had on there. Um, cost effectiveness, so I mentioned we put some of these things in and we took beds out later on. So we're, uh, we're a provider who's actually not in deficit as a result of having a system that flows. Um, and um, that's something that is a little bit rare these days, so we're pleased with that. But the most important KPI for me every single year is the National Staff Survey. And I think it should be for every single chief exec, because what this is telling us is really important. Would our staff recommend our services to their friends and family? Would they recommend us as an employer? Do they feel they're able to make a difference to patient care? And our indicators have, have, gone, have risen and risen through this, such that we're um, in the top 10 nationally for, for our staff survey. Um, 
That means our staff are happy, they're doing what they wanted to do, they're feeling engaged, but also um, there's a financial benefit for that. Um, we're able to recruit and retain staff, um, and th therefore it's a, a virtuous circle of having good staff and good quality. So key lessons, um, focus on action, not explanation, escalation. Um, far too many days in those previous winters, I've been on the phone in escalation meetings. Um, do we solve anything through those, explaining what happened yesterday rather than concentrating what, on what we're going to do next? That heart sink moment when the caller has left the conference, when you're just about to ask them to do something that might have helped. Um, that doesn't work for me. I think it is about getting on and doing things and empowering particularly clinical staff to make changes that they think will work and then reviewing whether they've made an impact. Transformation takes time. So for the first few weeks of putting in some of these things, our performance dipped. Um, but as we got used to it, our performance rose and improved dramatically. I'm a Man United fan, I have to admit to that on occasions. And uh, last season they changed the defence and for the first few weeks it did look a bit rough. Um, but they eventually got used to it, although we could probably debate whether they still have got used to it. But um, that these things, when you change things, uh, have, a, have an impact on people. You have to stay with it. Getting the clinical narrative right, we've talked about um, the link to mortality, which is the most important message that we must keep reinforcing. Using patient stories to look at your own systems and how it works, that was powerful for us. Using the good experience of others, but actually making sure that they're localised. So one of the things that happened post the Health Foundation work is that NHS Wales implemented some of these things across Wales. Um, and whilst it was quite flattering to see hospitals in Wales using Warwick charts to look at processes, we actually realised that they didn't always work for them because this was someone else's work. This wasn't their work. And, and we really need to make sure that you look at the good advice, but then tailor it and get some local ownership. Um, it'll always need fine tuning, so you make improvements, it changes the way flow works in other parts of the system. So this is about learning how to fish, not providing the fish. It is about the staff knowing these techniques. Uh, and then the other thing for us is the headroom. So the headroom in your performance is one thing that, that you, know, you, can, you can take some bad days, but headroom for staff is probably the most important thing. So having situations where on a day in, day out basis, our staff are upset, um, are feeling that they're not delivering for patients and are under pressure. Um, you can cope with the odd bad week or bad day, but if that's continuous, then that really does affect quality and morale. Um, so that's been one of the important messages for us. So uh, I've been seeing the cards going up at the back to say I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to end by um, identifying the fact that we've, there's a website which hopefully you've had access to, which is now available. You can email us on that address as well. Um, but of course, you'll have a chance to, to talk a little bit later on your tables about, uh, about what you've heard this morning. So thank you for listening. <laughs>